treat tonight. A dear friend, a global scholar, and world-renowned climate scientist who happens to live in our backyard is going to be our speaker tonight. And if you haven't heard him speak, it's people who come in are saying hi. But um, I actually think we met in Brazil, didn't we? We didn't actually meet in our city. Yeah, but not know when. Don't go by. So I'm a native Texan who's been in Iowa a long time. He did his undergraduate at Iowa State, but then in engineering. But he's done his, he did his, his master's and his PhD at the University of Texas. So we share that from the flip side. But Gerald Schnorr is the Allen S. Henry Chair in Engineering. He's the Professor of Occupational and Environmental Health and the Co-Director of the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research. And he um, specializes in hydroscience and engineering researcher, the Center for Biocatalyst and Bioprocessing Researcher, Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Institute. And he's the theme chairperson uh, at the American Chemical Society National Meeting Faculty Member of Human Toxicology Program, and a lot more. <laughs> uh, but what's really important is he has the capacity to take a wealth of very, very technical information and make it not just palatable and understandable to those of us who haven't done PhDs in engineering, but also make it relevant to our lives. And he focuses on water, he focuses on health, he focuses on the intersection and the nexus of that. And one of the things of which I'm particularly proud is that he uh, uh, owns a piece of the Nobel Peace Prize because the UN IPCC received the Nobel Peace Prize in, I think it was 2007. And so he was an Iowa scientist who was part of that global group of scientists who received along with former Vice President Al Gore, the Nobel Peace Prize at that time for the work that they had done on climate science and, under, and, and helping the global community, media, governments to, to understand what is so critical and important and why these decisions matter so much. So I hope you are prepared for a real high, a real treat. Go ahead. Make sure everyone turned your phones off or down. And I am pleased to introduce my friend, Dr. Gerald Schoen. It's a pleasure to be here with 100 grannies. Uh, for a livable future, Barbara Schlachter was uh, well known to me, and we did some events together. And it's hard to believe she's been uh, away from us two years now uh, in February, I think. But uh, I always liked she would emphasize uh, 100 grannies for a livable future to educate, advocate, and agitate about climate change. And uh, that's just what we need today. And aren't you just ready to get out there and agitate a little bit? So let's uh, talk about climate change. This is a uh, photo from space uh, taken uh, yesterday, actually. And uh, just to remind us about uh, the confined resource that we all live on, 7.5 billion of us now with a gross world product over $80 trillion and still increasing. And if you look closely uh, up at the north, you can see the nor'easter uh, devastating the east coast, the second uh, one of these bomb cyclones in one month, in the uh, uh, month of uh, February, March, and uh, that's pretty unusual. Carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas because it absorbs the radiation coming off of the Earth uh, more than would be natural. Uh, that's the part, big part of the problem, what we're talking about tonight. And it, ever since the Industrial Revolution, late 1700s, when we invented the steam engine and we first started to burn copious quantities of coal, uh, this signal has gone up, 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 up. If this were our We've gone to the doctor and this were our blood gases, I think you'd be a little bit concerned. And yeah, we should be we should be pretty concerned. It, it's 407 parts per million, so that's a trace gas. But uh, so you could ask the Philistine question, so what? But it's a radiatively important trace gas. We call it RITG. That means it changes the Earth's balance, and that's why it really matters. And we can't allow this to uh, continue forever. Well, <clears throat> on the day when the uh, 
exponentially increasing emissions, uh, my mathematic friends like to say, is monotonically increasing our emissions since the Industrial Revolution. When the day when we turn that curve upside down, we should have a big global celebration party. But we ain't there yet. As you can see, uh, this is global greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide uh, emissions in billions of metric tons uh, each and every year. And we'd like that to turn around and go down about 80% in the next 30 years or so. So since it's been doing nothing but increasing since the uh, late 1700s, uh, first to get it to level off and then to get it to turn that curve upside down, that's a big undertaking. The fossil fuel age, I like to tell my students, you know, it's been a good run. We've uh, powered our uh, transportation, warmed our homes, uh, done our industry, everything you wear, everything you see, everything your, uh, your habitation, all due to the burning of fossil fuels. But we know because of environmental constraints, it's got to stop. It's been a good run, but we've got to come into something that could be newer and better. And it doesn't even have to be painful, I would submit. Rather, it can be an engine for economic opportunity, how we create jobs, wealth, and prosperity in the 21st century. That's my, that's my uh, thesis, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> You know, may know that about mm, roughly 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere today have come from uh, Europe and U.S. and Japan, the uh, developed countries. So about 70% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere came from the developed world, including uh, the U.S. And so we have, bear a large responsibility to do something about it. You can argue that we enjoy... Uh, a high per capita income and a prosperous uh, uh, country because of the burning of those greenhouse gases that are up there. So I think we have somehow a moral obligation. But the US and Europe, you can see, uh, at least are beginning to level off their emissions and they're coming down a little bit. That's the yellow and the blue line. But the uh, orange line and the purple line is China and India. So. Now they've taken over as being the big emitters. My point of the slide isn't to point fingers at China because still their emissions are on a par uh, or slightly lower than European emissions on a per capita basis. But my point is to say that we're all in this together. We all bear some responsibility and certainly China and India are going to have to be a part of this story as well. And the, uh, if you want to put it into uh, uh, a sector, an economic sector, uh, coal is the biggest problem in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. That's the top brown line. You can see it just beginning to peak over. Maybe something is afoot there with coal, even on a global basis. But oil is still going up almost linearly. Gas, natural gas is still going up almost linearly. And you may be interested to know that more than 5% of all the emissions are due to uh, the cement making process where we take uh, calcium carbonate and turn it into calcium oxide, thus liberating carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that's building materials and, and uh, development. Whenever you have, uh, the, the red lines here are our emissions. First of all, from burning fossil fuels, the big red one on the left, and then also from clearing forests, uh, like in the Amazon, slash burning, and so forth, that contributes too. And the red arrows are bigger than the black arrows. The black arrows are the sinks, as we call them. That's the amount of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, taken up by the uh, forests as they grow and put on biomass, more and more uh, wood, and more and more carbon in the soil. And the oceans also are taking up carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, the red arrows are bigger than the black arrows, and that means that there has to be an accumulation somewhere, and it happens to be the atmosphere. And that continues to accumulate a radiatively important trace gas, which continues to 
heat our atmosphere. Now, uh, the heat uh, translates, yes? But just to clarify, having the ocean be a, a sink, a heat sink, is not really a positive, right? Well, right there, we're, we're not talking about uh, heat yet. Yeah, we're getting there, though. Oh, okay. uh, this is just the carbon dioxide, and it's taking up carbon okay. dioxide also, okay. which, which is uh, uh, the twin problem. It's not only one of uh, um, climate warming, uh, greenhouse warming, it's also one of acidification of the oceans because carbon dioxide is a, uh, a weak acid and, it, and it's acidifying our ocean. Last year was a super El Nino year, the warmest one on the recorded record. Our records go back to about 1880. This is the temperature anomaly. That just means the difference from average. And the difference from average here is compared to Let's say that a, a normal um, temperature on Earth should be taken from 1880 to 1920 before global warming really started to kick in. And since then, you can see that the 80, the decade of the 80s, for example, is significantly higher than previous times in temperature. The 1990s, more so than that. The 2000s, more than that. And really what I think you're looking at is the signal has emerged from the noise. The noise is the up and down variability year to year on Earth's uh, energy balance, which is subject to a lot of uh, variation. But the signal being average temperature is steadily going up. Now these El Ninos we know to be super warm because warm water from the Pacific accumulates at the surface. Later on it'll go back down and uh, mix again in a La Nina. That's what we have right now, as a matter of fact. And so, uh, but the trend is clear, that the trend is going up and up and up. And the anomaly is more than one degree Celsius now. And if you take the temperature of the Earth smeared over the whole surface, over all seasons, it's about 15 degrees Celsius. That's, um, I think, about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So one degree Celsius more, or about two degrees Fahrenheit more warming is quite a lot, actually, when considered over the whole planet, over all the seasons, average. And uh, the part of the United Nations that Diane Dillon originally and I have been a part of since 1992, at least me, uh, and I know that you were too, I didn't I attend the 1972 Stockholm Convention, but I wish I had been to that one, actually. Uh, anyway, um, this is uh, enough heat that the target is no more than two times this. We don't want to go any more than two degrees Celsius on a 15 degrees Celsius planet, because that really would change everything. We already have some significant effects that we're going to talk about. Now, if, to get that curve to turn upside down, to turn the frown upside down, we need to change our energy mix then from the fossil fuel age and transition out of the fossil fuel age. And we're doing that, but the rub is, the problem is we're not doing it fast enough. The uh, warming is occurring faster than the transition is occurring in these fuel mixes. Look at coal. It still uh, looks a little bit like it's going down now. These are year by year. So you're looking at the last 15 years in a bar diagram for coal. And oil is still going up at 1% per year each year. Gas and the size of them shows the contribution uh, to the uh, energy consumed. Gas is going up even faster at 1.7% per year. Nuclear is going down. We may want to talk about that. That's a good subject for discussion. Hydro is still going up worldwide, not so much here in the United States because we built out most of the good places for hydropower. Uh, but it's going up worldwide about 2.9% per year. And renewables happily are surging forward, 15% per year. But you can see how little it is still in the contribution to the total uh, primary energy mix. And we need that curve to look like coal, oil, and gas. Or said another way, I tell my students, in your lifetime, I just was 
uh, teaching just a few minutes ago over in Van Allen Hall. In your lifetime, you can expect three things to happen. We'll phase out of coal, oil, and natural gas in that order. I guarantee you, in their lifetime, maybe not my lifetime. But coal first, because it's the dirtiest, and it emits the most. Peabody Coal Company, the largest coal company in the world, is already declared bankruptcy. They can't borrow money. They can't sell the assets that they've got. Oil will be next. Watch for signs of it. People are already arguing to divest uh, their oil interest. Oil will be next after that. And finally, it will be oil and gas companies with natural gas. Because we've got to phase out all three of those. And the one on the right, and the one maybe nuclear and hydro, has to grow much more. The biggest hope is for the renewables, solar and wind. I, w I don't have time to go into it tonight, and, and uh, maybe I'd put you to sleep, but suffice it to say that the evidence is absolutely massive. I don't know any scientists who don't believe that this is a serious problem and that we should be doing something about it. It's, uh, it comes to us from surface monitoring at airports, temperature records. It comes from uh, ocean uh, vessels going across the oceans. It comes from space, from satellites from space. It comes from uh, um, uh, fossil records. It comes from tree rings. It comes from ice cores. It comes from isotopic measurements. It comes from so many locations. We can measure the wavelengths emanating from the Earth and passing through the clouds, and we can see that we've lost the ones absorbed by the CO2. So much evidence, and it all points the same way, that this is a very serious problem and that it's caused by us. The evidence is just massive. One of the biggest pieces of evidence, and really for me the absolute smoking gun, is the Argo uh, um, sand program, the floating buoys in the ocean, which record the temperature and the uh, salinity of the ocean everywhere. They come up, maybe you can see in the center there, about every eight to 10 days, and they absorb the sun's energy, they're solar powered. And then they go through a programmed dive down to 2,000 or more meters, mm -hmm. measuring very precisely the temperature of the ocean and the salinity. And why? Because if you want to know the heat capacity, that thermal capacity of the ocean, it's so immense. If you want to see if the Earth is really warming, you go to the oceans, not the atmosphere. 91% of the heat that we've added is in the oceans. So we're, ma we're making the oceans warmer, and since two, about 2005, we know very precisely how much warmer they are. And they, you can see the signs on this bottom slide. If you go online, you can see in real time where they're floating. We've got about 4,000 of them out there uh, programmed. It's a big international program, which the U.S. no one participates in. The amount of warming is about mm, 0.77 watts per square meter. That may not sound like much. It's roughly about the wattage of one of the tiny little twinkle bulbs on a, on a Christmas tree a stand, but it's on every single meter square of the entire Earth, 24-7, 365 days a year. And uh, that is enough to make this 0.77 watts per square meter is more, 20 times more than the heat from burning all the fossil fuels each and every year. So it's an immense amount of heat being added to the ocean, way more than anything we ourselves can possibly do, except through this feedback mechanism of these radiatively important trace gases magnifying the effect of burning the fossil fuels. So they've indeed made the oceans warmer. In the last 50 years or so, about one degree Fahrenheit warmer. Remember, the atmosphere is about one degree Celsius warmer, that's 1.8 degree Fahrenheit, and the oceans are a little more, bit more than one degree Fahrenheit, so there's a lag going on. First, the atmosphere is warm, that makes sense, because it's putting a blanket over the atmosphere, 
and the heat is being transferred down into the ocean. And the amount of heat is a lot. And if you were to have told me when I went to school, like the students I'm teaching now, that in my lifetime we would change the oceans, I would have said, you're, you're crazy. The, the, the thermal mass is just too gargantuan. There's no way that humans could change the temperature of the ocean. But we are, and we have really good proof of it, uh, really solid evidence. And what's more, those gases that we were asked about earlier, they're actually acidifying the entire ocean as well. About a 30% increase in the acidity of the ocean in the last 50 years, if you can imagine. So we're, our activity is great enough that we can change even the oceans in a 50 year period, and we're doing it. This is the ocean acidity. The red line is the line we looked at earlier of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The blue line is the carbon dioxide in the oceans. And the green line is the pH, which is a sign of the acidity increasing, the pH going down, down, down. You may have read that this winter, the ice off of the north coast of Greenland is gone. It's never been observed before to have uh, no ice there in the month of uh, January. This ice is floating in the Arctic, so it doesn't raise sea level because it's already exerted its buoyant effect, uh, Archimedes. But uh, it does cause harm for uh, anything, the ecology, like uh, bears, which need to fish off the ice. And they're definitely in peril. We're losing the ice at about 4% per decade right now. This ice is up above on land, so when it melts, it does add to the sea level. It's the surface melt on Greenland. Uh, it's, uh, this is called a shaft or a moulin, and uh, we worry about not only the amount of water melting off of Greenland, it's about half of Lake Erie each year melting off of it, but when it gets down to the surface of the, of the uh, Greenland, it can lubricate. The, the, these glaciers are moving by gravity over, gla over glacial time, very uh, long time, uh, towards the ocean and calving into icebergs. But we worry about the abrupt change that can happen when the, this lubricant, this uh, ice water, goes down below and causes the slippage off. And we are beginning to see an increase in the calving of the icebergs. You may have read about last uh, July, uh, Larsen Sea ice shelf off western Antarctic broke off. It was about the size of Rhode Island. It broke off, and it's in a series of uh, events shown here off of western uh, Antarctica. We know, believe it or not, from satellite data, when the satellites fly over Antarctica, according to uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation, uh, two large masses attract. So there's a deviation on the satellite's orbit as it goes over this large ice mass. And we can measure that deviation. And the strength of the deviation is a measure of how much mass of ice there is. So we know that pretty well from space. We're losing roughly 30 to 150, depending on the year, a billion of tons of ice each and every year from Antarctica. And we can measure it. And it's also these, uh, the breakaway of the ice shelves shown in the bottom photo. If you live in Miami, you might be worried about your real estate. It's becoming a hot potato uh, because uh, the realtors are worried about, I got to sell this one fast and I don't want to be have the hot potato when uh, the uh, rubber meets the road. And the slide on the, the photo on the right shows if we have one meter of sea level rise, which is less than the average projected by the end of this century, if we have one meter, the red area will be inundated. It's all of Miami, a <coughs> good portion of Dade County, most of the Everglades, most of Naples. Remember that lot you were gonna buy at Fort Myers? <laughs> Don't go there. I'm serious, they're going underwater. And some people know it, and some people don't want to know it. 
but they're going underwater. They already have blue sky flooding uh, due to king tides, high, high tides in Miami, like they never did before. 30, 40 days a year of blue skies due to a high, high tide, uh, and uh, still water in the streets. No storms. There's several other feedback loops that we could talk about. Uh, one is the uh, so-called Gulf Stream current. Uh, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Ocean Circulation, which uh, uh, if the melting of Greenland becomes any more severe, and we've seen through the fossil record that this has happened in past uh, uh, climates, um, it could push the Gulf Stream south, making the uh, northern Europe much more uh, cold, but everywhere else uh, much more uh, warmer, and that's one that we worry about. Another one is the melting of the tundra and the permafrost and the uh, methane release from that, which could greatly increase another important greenhouse gas, uh, methane gas. We worry about extremes. The climatologists that I work with, uh, they're more worried about the extremes than the means. In fact, you can hardly get them to talk about the average change in temperature or the average amount of heat. Uh, we think of Hurricane Sandy in light of these events that we had uh, in the northeast coast just in the last month. It was the largest uh, uh, hurricane on record on the east coast. It was about almost a thousand miles in sizes of continental sized storms that were observed. Now, it was the lowest pressure ever measured on the east coast, 940 millibars. Greatest damage at that time. And it followed Hurricane Irene, a very similar storm by only one year. There was Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Again, as big as the entire Philippines, continental sized storm. 6,000 people perished. One minute winds of 235, gusts of 235 miles per hour. Lowest pressure ever measured in the Southwest Pacific, 895 millibars. Hurricane Patricia is an interesting one. It spun up faster. It was not predicted at all. It spun up in a 48-hour period. No climatologist knew about it. It was caused by warm waters about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, sea surface temperature. These storms are powered by uh, warm seas, and the seas are warmer than ever before. Fortunately, it hit an uninhabited area. No fatalities from this storm, and it burned out pretty quickly. But look at that pressure, 879 millibars pressure. Just keeps going down, 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 our observational records. Well, we had Harvey uh, last year, as you know, over Houston, shown on the slide on the right, 51.88 inches of rainfall uh, near Houston, 24 inches of rain in 24 hours uh, across the area, a third of the Houston flooded, most expensive storm yet, $180 billion in damages. One has to pause, I think, and ask themselves the question, when does it uh, make more sense to act than not to act? From a purely financial aspect, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of cost to the United States of America from these storms. Unexpected, unknown. When is it more expensive not to act than to act. And it was followed by Irma, as you know, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it also uh, hit other places in the Caribbean. It had uh, the lowest uh, uh, pressure since Katrina, uh, 420 miles wide, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, almost like bath water. The sea surface temperature is spawning these storms. Interestingly, what our models tell us is that the number of tropical cyclones and storms uh, due to climate change and the warming of the seas should not increase. In fact, probably decrease the total number of storms. But the category four and especially the category five storms, those are the ones that are going to increase. And that's sort of what we're observing also. They're going to increase because of the much warmer sea surface temperatures that we're observing. Well, there's Maria. 
I'm sorry, this is the one for Puerto Rico. I messed up in there. Irma, that was the one for Florida and the Caribbean. This is Maria. And there's still people without power, as you know, in Puerto Rico. For us, it means more intense rainfall. We have the one percentile events, the most extreme rainfall events are much more frequent than they used to be, and generally more intense also. The, if you look back in our record, and I've actually done this, you're hard pressed to find back in the 1880s and 90s a day when we had more than four inches of rain. That's about 100 millimeters. Now, four inch rainstorms around here are routine almost every year. Things have really changed. The precipitation pattern, the intensity of the storms. Oops. I highlight the one very unusual uh, to have a flood in Iowa in uh, September. But we did have one in 2016, the Cedar River Basin uh, flood. Uh, this shot from Evansdale, Iowa, up in northeast uh, Iowa. Uh, it crested at 22 feet. It was the second worst in Cedar Rapids since the 2008 flood as it came down the uh, Cedar River. And uh, we evacuated the New Bowen time check area, and, and uh, due to the barriers, uh, we escaped a bullet here. Diane and I and many, many people were at the World Climate Summit in Paris, and it was so exciting because there was a a uh, really hopeful uh, meeting when everybody came together about this problem and really you could say the start of a new era in climate change uh, policy. It was a universal agreement. All the countries, uh, President 195 and the European Union agreed that this is a serious problem, that they're going to pledge to do something about it, uh, and two main uh, uh, pieces of of it that we'll talk about, but there will be voluntary cuts in emissions. Notice the word voluntary, we can talk about that. That uh, th there will be um, uh, shifts in world finance to a more low carbon sustainable development, and that we would begin for the first time, even though it's a United Nations, under the United Nations auspices, for the first time we'll try to take account of what the cities and businesses and NGOs are doing. And folks, that, that's where the action is. It's not really at the United Nations level. It's at the, it's at the more local scale. That's where things are getting done. That's where emissions are coming down. That's where our hope is, even though we have a threat uh, in a very real and present danger uh, uh, threat. Uh, he can't really withdraw from the Paris Agreement, not easily. Uh, he can wait four years and uh, uh, take the United States name off this particular agreement. Uh, I don't think they're talking about withdrawing from the UNFCC, which was established at uh, the Rio or summit way back in 1982, because then we wouldn't even have a seat at the table if we did that. Or he could simply not do anything. And that's kind of what it seems to be is uh, shaping up. And, but the U.S. leadership was needed because we emitted a lot of the emissions, as we talked about, and we're supposed to be a magnanimous and wealthy and prosperous country who hopefully uh, looks out after their uh, neighbors. And so for both moral grounds and ethical grounds, I think we should be a part of it. I wrote this article uh, while I was in Paris about the emissions gap. I wish I could tell you that Paris is the be-all and end-all, but it's not. Paris takes us towards those yellow and orange. That's emissions on the left-hand scale, and on the x-axis is time from 2020 to 2030. And it shows where we are, roughly following the orange there, and where we need to be, the blue, even with Paris uh, fully adopted and all the countries doing what they say. So we run models at our center here at the university. And many other people are running models. And what the models seem to tell us is that 
uh, even the proven reserves of fossil fuels that we have, we cannot afford to burn those. Even the proven reserves. I'm not talking about the oil that they're looking for in the Arctic now, because there's no ice there and they can explore it. I'm talking about the already discovered, proven reserves owned by the oil companies. We cannot burn all of those. Uh, if we do, we will exceed all the goals of the Paris Agreement. We'll, we'll blow two degrees Celsius warming out of orbit into three or four or five, and it just keeps going. It just keeps increasing until we get our, our arms around this problem and transition out of it. Fossil fuel. We can do it. Uh, look how many jobs uh, wind energy has created in Iowa alone. We can do it with solar. That's the one piece we're really missing to the puzzle, which we can build out on a distributed basis. We can do it with energy efficiency. We can do it with uh, people working together, the cities, the regions, the businesses. And we can create jobs and wealth and prosperity and survive this problem. But we can't wait too long because the damages are great enough that they'll circumvent everything if we don't get going. And so the aqua uh, circle in the middle is how much we think we still could burn and keep the warming at a survivable level, two, two or, or more degrees uh, Celsius, twice what we have so far. Already we have all the effects I, I showed you. The red is what's in proven reserve. So that means stress, I think. The students at Paris were so fun to be around. Uh, that was the first time I learned about the keep it in the ground campaign. They were already all over this issue that, no, we can't. We can't even burn what we have, let alone any kind of future uh, discoveries. And it's called the keep it in the ground campaign. Uh, we're talking about roughly two, the estimates vary, but a uh, reasonable estimate is that we have the, all the oil companies own $2 trillion, and national uh, uh, oil companies too, own $2 trillion in assets with a T. And that's that part that we can't burn. So uh, the uh, economists call that stranded assets. And that means huge stress because that means lost uh, money for the shareholders. And so it's going to really be stressful this period, but also joyful in making this transition to a new way of uh, a new economy. We can do it still. Time is running out. I would say we really need to begin to uh, uh, turn that curve that we looked at at the very first upside down in the next five years and have reductions of 50 to 80 percent by 2050. So it tells me a whole new way of doing business, transitioning out of the fossil fuel age. Under Obama, we made all these pledges on the left. Um, uh, Marrakesh, we agreed to 80 percent reductions by 2050, but I guess all that is in the bands right now uh, with our current leadership. I got to meet people from the Maldive Islands uh, in Paris. Uh, this is a shot taken from space. The blue atolls, so beautiful. But they're already having to move off of uh, some of their land. And they're really worried. The second part of the agreement was not just a, a decrease in the emissions, but rather uh, raising money for the poorest, most vulnerable, and most affected countries. And those are island nations and coastal nations. And they're talking about a lot of money is needed. They have big needs. Uh, they're, they're, they're losing their land. They're losing their home. Uh, $100 billion per year is the target. The most, some of the most vulnerable nations are shown here. The UN, thank heaven, somebody is trying to talk about these things. The United Nations is working out metrics. Uh, to determine who should get money if we can uh, make this transfer payment. We're talking about transfer payment here. But it is a team effort and that everybody is putting it together. Uh, together. But uh, the metrics are shown here to determine it if your country has vulnerability. Island nations, coastal nations, 
poor countries, countries subject to drought, sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. The pledges have come in, but they're short of what was hoped for. Uh, we now currently have about $10 billion in pledges. The U.S. pledged $3 billion under Obama, and we paid $1 billion of the $3 uh, billion. But you can see on a per capita basis just some of the countries and some of the pledges. We're only at $10 billion total, and we want to be at $10 billion per year. So we're far short of the goal, and not all of the $10 billion uh, has been collected either, that has been pledged. So what's the happy news here? Well, the happy news here is that we, I, I truly believe we, we can do this. And what's more, we're going to come to the realization that we have to do this. At Paris, we had that. It was exciting. It was invigorating to be there. We don't have it yet in our country, as you know. And uh, despite the New York Times telling us that, oh, I think it was a Bloomberg poll a couple of weeks ago, 70% of Americans feel uh, that climate change is a real problem and want to do something about it, and it's due to humans, uh, it hasn't evolved into action yet. And so I think we have to keep the Paris Agreement. You know, maybe uh, with the U.S. kind of reneging, it will spur others on. It looks like China and maybe the EU. Uh, will come to the forefront, but I sure wish it was uh, our country for the reasons we talked about. We're going to have to adapt to climate change because it's here already. I, think, I hope I've convinced you of that. I didn't show you any models because I think just the data is enough alone of what's already happening. It's very stark. Yes? You keep having this acronym GHGs, and I'm Oh, greenhouse gases. I'm, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm, okay. so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Got it. And we have, to, we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. That means transitioning out of the fossil fuel age. And the hope is, the action is, at the cities, the states, the regions, the businesses. Yes, the businesses are taking a real leadership in some sectors. And uh, NGOs are all going to work together uh, to do that in our country. And hopefully, the Paris Agreement will survive and still be a force uh, for the whole planet as a whole. We need to embrace solar, wind, storage, grid, nuclear power. We can talk about all, all of these. Nuclear power won't deliver much in the near future simply because it takes so long to uh, invest and bring a, a power plant onto line. We're talking about changes that are needed in the next five years or ten years or so. So with that, I would open it up for uh, questions. Yes. The, the disparity between countries with the pledges per capita, how, how are those? Again, you know, to get an agreement, uh, you could, Diane, I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts on this, but uh, you could say that they were, did a masterful thing, or mm, some would say uh, not so much. But uh, to, everything is volu it was voluntary. In order to get everybody to agree, for the first time, you know, that's the first time we ever got all the countries, rich and poor, developed and developing, everybody to agree. Everything pretty much had to be voluntary. And we knew, for example, the United States could not take a formal treaty through the Senate and get it passed, ever. So everything is voluntary, so this is what the best we could get by soft law, by trying to uh, peer pressure, trying to embarrass each other. And so that, that's sort of how it works. Yes. Just to one point, in 92 at the Earth Summit, there was a 7% GDP that was negotiated that didn't happen. That's true. Um, but the Scandinavian countries stepped up to the plate. Yeah. Norway, yeah. Sweden. Yeah. Um, yeah. They actually made their 7% contribution. Towards this, what's to now called the Green Climate Fund. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a good point. Yes. You showed a slide earlier um, of changes in weather pattern or rainfall patterns. Yes. And you said in the upper Midwest, from yes. Ohio to Minneapolis. But the Northwest was even worse. Right. The Northeast was even worse. Right. But I, the, the question I have is that you, you said it was like a 45% change. Increase in the worst storms. Okay. So it, it's not fluctuating from 
what I'm trying to get at is, is that just in the amount of moisture that's falling or the increase in storms, or does that include drought? That was the frequency of the most, the one percentile of the most severe storms. So it's increasing by 45%. Yes, 45% more frequent. Okay. Yes. Um, on one of your slides, you mentioned that progress is being, most progress is being made at local levels. Yes. Um, in, in, in our country. Yes. In Iowa City, we have a lot of building going on, a lot of glass. Is there any evidence that any of that's being done with energy efficiency in mind? Actually, the, uh, you know, we have a, the city council has a committee right now. One of my friends right across the hall is on it. The numbers are incredibly optimistic for Iowa City, but for a reason, uh, let me tell you the reason. Uh, because Mid-America, you know, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett, we've changed our mix of energy to a great proportion of wind here that Iowa City is uh, using by transmission. So our greenhouse gas emissions have gone down, down, down in, in Iowa City without doing anything, you know, it's all mid-america and uh, power that we're buying we have at the if you put a bubble around uh, iowa city coralville we have reduced emissions even at our um, university power plant by burning uh, biomass so we've done a little bit on our own but it's mostly due to this mix of power but see that that could be true for everybody california has done that that could be true for everybody that they could uh, create we've got six or seven thousand new jobs in the wind power industry. There's only 50,000 coal miners left in the whole country. Here more in Iowa, we- for, More people work for Walmart than there are coal miners. By far, by <laughs> far. <laughs> that's, the that's the future. Yes. Are there any strategies for sequestering greenhouse gases that might help for any problems? Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't cover it. And actually, I was just lecturing about it to my students, but there's uh, trying to deep six the carbon dioxide in concentrated streams into the subsurface uh, environment and where it would become uh, stable. But there's so many problems associated with that, including that it could burp and uh, carbon dioxide come up and suffocate everybody. Uh, carbon dioxide has a molecular weight of 44, so it's heavier than air. So it would, it would hang around wherever the hole burped and kill everybody. So there, there's, there's issues. I, I don't see it going very well. We're, we're looking at how to scrub it out of the air and put it into algae. And there's a lot of research going on, but nothing looks real promising right now. Yes? I heard on um, public radio that um, the Iowa one of the things from Paris was agreements between countries to share technology, and that in some ways that might be the saving grace. Um, I didn't but see I, that. I'd be I interested. I wonder in what you thought of that. If, I think it's a that's great actually idea. Actually happening, or is that just something on paper? No, that that actually it's part of this agenda solutions. Uh, that was part of Agenda 24, mm -hmm. and the corporate world. Renewed on stepping up to the plate because they said it's proprietary. But on the positive, I'm trying to be positive. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, the positive on the positive side, um, uh, with the Montreal Protocol for the stratospheric ozone layer, we did pass a, a global, and it's a, a tremendous success story. And the companies under George Herbert Walker Bush, he first came into office, I'll never forget it. He told, the, and maybe a Republican was the only one who could do it, but he told industry, Dow, DuPont, and so forth, thou shalt license your technology to the developing countries for free so they can make this next generation uh, less harmful uh, refrigerants. And they said, what? <laughs> You're in shock. And no, he said, you're going to do that. And they, and they did it. And they did it. So we have some. And industry and academia and government all worked seamlessly together on that, mm -hmm. on that agreement. And even now, because the gases live so long, uh, we still have chemicals in the atmosphere, but there's some sign that the problem is maybe beginning to get a little bit better. 
as a result of what we did. And you said this was about the refrigerant. It was, and about the ozone layer, but interestingly, if we hadn't done that agreement and changed those re, uh, CFC refrigerant chemicals, they would be the most important greenhouse gases by far. They would dwarf carbon dioxide right now. And we'd be much, much warmer than we are right now. Because they're both a greenhouse gas, these refrigerants, and destroy the uh, ozone uh, layer. So we get two bangs for one buck. Yes? The R-12, which was thought of as the biggest problem, the yes. aircraft industry dumps it. They use it as a cleaning. R-12 is in a lot of use. You think it's still being, well, it, it can't be getting much use compared to what it was because yeah. we we monitor for it. So yeah. we know, that that's, he's talking about the one that we used in our uh, car air conditioners, 2CF2Cl2, dichlorodifluoromethane. And that was the nastiest one, mm -hmm. you're right. But we do monitor for that. And while I don't doubt you that there's leaks, my brother used to like to restore 55, 6, and 7 Chevys. And he could, on the black market, always get free on. Uh, so I know there are illicit uses, but it can't be anything like that. easily convert those to 134. Yeah. But I think hydrogen is the fuel. Of course, hydrogen, we can't mine it, or we got to make it from something. So maybe we could make it from, uh, you know, reform, uh, from uh, steam reforming with wind energy. But because at night, our, our wind blows better at night. You might be surprised about this in Iowa than it does during the daytime. And we don't really need it at, at night. So we should be doing something like making hydrogen or Well, I something. have hydrogen for automobiles. Yeah, well, that's what you could yeah. make it for. Yeah. It also, you can convert natural gas pipelines to be hydrogen pipelines without, it's not a it's, without it's oil. It's too much oil. work. That's right. I, I noticed that your last thing here has efficiency as the first. And yes. It does, doesn't look like it's in alphabetical order. So maybe there's a reason why efficiency is first. Most but, experts but still is, claim we could get 20% with yeah. not too the, much of uh, first. Uh, Mid America, aside from going. In, is not going to win because they're in favor of diminishing climate change. They're going to win because they think it's going to be more profitable in the long run for them. And while they're going to win, they, the last I knew, and it might have changed by now, they have put in proposals to eliminate their efficiency, pro their home efficiency programs that they have for low income people. Uh, but the uh, one question, I, I'm always in favor of, of efficiency as the way to do things. It's much more cost effective than most of these other things. But in terms of solar and wind, my understanding is in terms of the energy, it's, they're what you would call not energy dense compared to coal and oil. That's which fair. means that when you have uh, solar arrays or wind farms, they're going to take up much more land space than a coal mine uh, or an underground uh, pipeline or uh, uh, fossil fuel would do. Any idea how much space? I mean, if one converted, got rid of all coal and oil and had only solar and wind, how much land space would have to be covered by these? Oh, we could do it. Uh, the, I know you could do it. Three states alone could power North Dakota, South Dakota, and Texas could power uh, all the electricity needs for wind. So there's plenty. There's plenty of space, and there's an advantage to the fact that it's distributed. I agree with you. Uh, and that is that it could be at the home of every of every person distributed. And uh, unlike coal and oil, nobody owns it. You own it. Nobody owns it. Whoever is there owns it. Anyone can harvest it. Once you make that investment, you never have to buy fuel again. Never have to buy fuel again. Because it's provided on a renewable basis from the sun. Without, it's got a lot of big advantages. And without the toxic. Without the toxic. toxic. Yes. You mentioned the acidification in, in the ocean. And I can see where that trend would be a disaster for marine life. Is there also a corresponding consequence for land life if the if the ocean dies? 
not that we've seen so far. It is true, you, you've probably uh, read that uh, plants, many plants will grow uh, faster with carbon dioxide, but they become also kind of water hogs and they may end up being uh, water short as a result of this uh, stimulus. But so far, I haven't read any equivalent acidification on land. It's a weak acid and it seems to be affecting the ocean much more than our lakes and streams and forests. But, but the loss of life in the ocean is not going to have a major effect on land life. Oh, in the that ocean. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's really scary, the loss of life in the oh, yeah. That's the base of our food chain. Yes. The ocean That's where we came from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm just going to say the ocean's died. We died. Yeah. Well, I don't understand that connection, though. If somebody explain that to me, I'd appreciate it. I, 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 maybe we should talk afterwards. Okay. I, I think it's very scary and I don't know all the ramifications. But the food chain part of it is pretty clear. Yeah, the fishing. Well, fish obviously going to hurt a lot of people if fish are gone. Yes. But are, are we living on fish that much, actually, here in the United States? Uh, uh, it's a percentage of our protein. I don't know what that percent is off the top of my head. I mean, it's, it's a dynamic process in terms of a whole ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, but that's right. I'm not seeing the jump from the marine ecosystem. It's not a jump, that's the point. It's, it's layered and connected. Well, there has to be a continuity there. You know, I, I, I don't understand it. I'm just asking for someone to Can I suggest a film you might watch that is just here? Chasing Coral really can help begin to give you a real sense. It literally was just shown this past Monday. Um, it, it really gives you a better sense of the connectivity of this. Did we do it? Well, yes. I have a question. You talked about how we need to do it at the local levels and state level, but we're, we're fighting um, in America right now about cutting energy efficiency programs. They don't even want to go solar. You know, how well, do they we hate fight? solar because I mean, they can't control it. Right. And we so own it. That's how why. How do we fight that? I mean, we can, here in Iowa City, write to our legislators, call them up, and they'd be agreeing with us, but we're not the only ones that are voting in Des Moines. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people out there that probably are not aware. There's a flyer over there on the table about this. Um, it's a Senate Bill 3093, but I think it's also called 2311, too. I was just trying to look it up. The energy. See, we're supposed to debate it today, and I don't know what happened. Oh, in Des Moines? In Des Moines. I didn't know that. <clears throat> I didn't mean to uh, so uh, be a you. proponent for uh, Mid-America. I was just saying that they have the largest share of wind, and it has changed our, our energy mix. But we need the power yes. programs. I, I agree with you yes. completely. And... Uh, our state legislature required those, and I hope they continue to require those. Well, it's, it's at risk in the current bill, that's up, and it's, the language is deceptive. It truly is deceptive because it says it codifies it, but it, it removes the, the automatic act. It makes it a voluntary opt-in, and it's a two-year time period, so you can't just opt-in continuously. So okay. I kind of like, excuse me, I kind of list back here of other senators that we could call around the state that they have uh, said would be helpful to say no to this bill. Efficiency should be number one, and it wasn't an accident, as you said, or alphabetical. That should be number one. Thanks, everybody.